Next on the news, it's just one of the benefits of a Catholic school education. As school violence across the country surges, Catholic students in the Diocese of Brooklyn say this is exactly where they come to feel safe. I'm Jessica East Hope. That story is ahead. A thousand miles away from the chaos at the U.S.-Mexico border, a Haitian family is spending their first Christmas here in New York, and a Catholic priest is helping to make it all happen. Then Red Storm Reception. Bishop Robert Brennan celebrating his first Sunday Mass as the Shepherd of Brooklyn and Queens at his alma mater. Three, two, one. Grand Army Plaza is all decked out for Christmas with 16,000 lights and a life-sized nativity scene. Make it Plus, Christian singer Matt Marr is headlining this year's Spirit of Christmas concert at the brand new Emea Center, and there's still time to get tickets. We'll tell you how. I'm Christine Persichetti. The special edition of Currents News starts right now. Violence is on the rise at New York City's public schools. Hundreds of students have been caught carrying knives and some even guns to class. But it's a very different story at Catholic schools. As Currents News' Jessica Easthope reports from Fresh Meadows, faith, moral values, and strict policy make all the difference. The bell rings and the hallways at St. Francis Prep flood with students. There are 2,400 of them. They say it can get pretty crowded, but what it doesn't get is violent. There's a lot of security and a lot of uh, protection around me, so I don't have to be worried about anything. 16-year-old Diona's Best carries the weight of his future with him every day. He says at school he's allowed to stay focused on his work because there's nothing and no one to run from. I don't have to worry about constantly being, you know, watched or lurked or I can just, you know, stay in my books and do what I have to do. Dionis and his classmates at prep are experiencing high school very differently than students at New York City's public high schools. This school year alone, 10 firearms and 790 knives were brought to public schools in New York City. And from July to October, nine school safety agents were injured as a result of student misconduct. St. Francis Prep says they've had three incidents of confrontation among students in two years, and they don't even keep statistics on weapons brought to school because, to their knowledge, it's never happened. St. Right. Francis Prep has a zero tolerance policy against any violence. There are 150 cameras in the building and ex NYPD security officers. Principal Patrick McLaughlin says Catholic schools are not immune to violence, but rather have a secret weapon against it. That Catholic mission sort of holds everything together. It's like a glue when you have prayer in school. McLaughlin's aware of what goes on in public schools and says many students bring weapons to protect themselves. How do I expect someone to sit in a physics class if they're afraid that someone's bullying them on social media or someone's carrying a weapon? Diona says he feels safer at prep than he does in his corner of East New York. I'm surrounded by people that care. The halls are crowded but with people who make him feel safe. In Fresh Meadows, Jessica East Hope, Currents News. For more information on how to send your child to Catholic schools in the Diocese of Brooklyn, go to catholicschoolsbq.org, then click on Find a School. If it were up to New York City's council, you would not have to be an American citizen to cast your ballot. On Thursday, the council approved a measure that will allow non-citizens in the city, nearly 800,000 people, to vote in municipal elections, including for mayor and council, but not in federal elections for Congress and president. Mayor Bill de Blasio believes there will be some legal challenges and questions some aspects of the idea, but says he will not veto it. A bit of good news for the members of that Ohio-based Christian mission who've been desperate to bring home their members held hostage by a violent gang in Haiti. Christian Aid Ministries say three more were freed on Sunday. This means 12 remain abducted in Port-au-Prince. 17 in total were kidnapped in mid-October, including five children, one just eight months old at the time. The gang had asked for $1 million ransom per hostage. The mission is not releasing the identities of those freed at this time. Many Haitian immigrants to the United States understand the dire conditions the captives are facing all too well. They lived them before they escaped from Haiti, finding refuge in the United States. Current News' Jessica Easthope reports on a family that says their long journey is finally over. 
Yes. That's right. <laughs> when he saw the a family sitting around the table, eating and laughing. A home cooked meal ready on the stove. It looks idyllic, but only if you don't know where they've been. My wife was really traumatized by all of the people we saw suffering along the road, especially the children dying. She felt like she and our child could have died too. For a month and a half, Linda Aurelus and Jean Altenor, like more than 15,000 other Haitians, were on the move, walking most of the way from Chile to Texas, headed for the Del Rio border. We knew we couldn't go back to Haiti. We could never go back, so we saw the opportunity and decided to join a big group and go. They arrived in Cambria Heights in September with just the clothes on their backs. They were taken in by Marie and Joseph Aurelus, Linda's aunt and uncle. Their journey is beyond comprehension. The agony they went through. They left Haiti fleeing political violence in 2017 after Linda's cousin was murdered. Now they're starting over in another foreign country. But here it's the promise of the Diocese of Brooklyn to keep them safe. That's why we have to come as a community, as church, to see how, what can we do to accompany those people in long terms. Of the 1,000 Haitians who made it from the border to New York, 200 have settled in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Uh, Father Hilaire Belazer, the coordinator of the Ministry to Haitian Immigrants, has been helping them get settled. Jesus identified himself with the poor, the needy, you know, and that's the face I saw in those migrants. People who made it through the border aren't eligible for refugee status. They're all relying on host families like Marie and Joseph. As Catholics, there is no greater reward. Jessica East Hope, Currents News. Linda and Jean, like the other Haitians that made it up from the border, are required to appear in court and make a case for themselves as to why they should be allowed to stay. But their lives continue to hang in the balance. Their appointment isn't until May. And if you want to help others like Linda and Jean make a new home in New York City, Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens is on the front lines resettling migrants. If you want to donate to their cause, just head over to ccbq.org and click Give Now. Turning now to a welcome homecoming, the new Bishop of Brooklyn, Robert Brennan, visiting his alma mater, St. John's University. While Bishop Brennan says the campus has changed a lot in the decades since he left, what hasn't changed is the feeling of home he gets when stepping on the Queens campus. And those feelings were returned in a huge red storm reception. From the pews at St. Thomas More Church. <laughs> To the hardwood at Carneseca Arena, Bishop Robert Brennan takes the St. John's University campus by storm. The newly installed 8th Bishop of Brooklyn back at his old stomping grounds. He's a 1984 graduate of the university. This place is very, very much home to me. The ch ch church, the chapel here is new since I've uh, graduated, but the campus here is very, very familiar grounds to me. Um, this is a very special place to me. And it was special for current students, too, as the bishop chose the beautiful church in the middle of campus to be the first place he celebrated Sunday Mass as Brooklyn's new shepherd. He told the students he wants to be there for them. I think it just speaks highly of us, our community and uh, just makes us look really good. The students gave Bishop Brennan a gift, pictures of various moments of his life, including his St. John's University graduation photo. He says being a student here really prepared him to be a priest. During the four years I was here between 1980 and 1984, I learned an awful lot. I learned a lot of practical uh, knowledge, but I learned a lot about myself and I learned about the way that God was working in my life and in the life of others. And after Mass, it was game time. The bishop was there to watch the Red Storm take on Fordham and win. He even got his own jersey. I, I hope that the students here today feel as home here now as I did in my time and will always um, have St. John's as part of their life. And Bishop Brennan just might put that jersey to good use. He says watching the St. John's basketball team play was one of the things he missed most when he moved to Columbus. St. John's wasn't the bishop's only stop in his first week. He kicked off the season of giving with one of the diocese's largest parties yet, the annual Bishop's Christmas Luncheon.
The Ave Maria started off the event, which raises money for the Bishop's Scholarship Fund to help send children across the diocese to Catholic school. 900 people attended the annual luncheon at Russo's on the Bay in Queens, and it was Bishop Robert Brennan's first. Three people were honored. That's Bishop Emeritus Nicholas DiMarzio, who received the St. John Paul II Distinguished Steward Stewardship Award. He's standing with Editor Emeritus of the Tablet, Ed Wilkinson, who was presented with the Emma A. Daniels Benefactors Award, and Robert Sherling, board chair of Divine Wisdom Catholic Academy, who received the Spirit of Hope Award. Bishop Brennan commended the work of the Diocese of Brooklyn in keeping Catholic education a priority. So visually today is really the product of the foresight and tradition, a lot of hard work and people being together in a team manner. And I know you all are a great democratic people. People like you make a difference. You you make an enormous difference in the lives of so many children and so many families. Organizers say for students and families who require financial assistance, the pandemic made the need even greater. The event raised more than $300,000, which will go towards scholarships for hundreds of students and will support the Catholic Youth Ministry Initiative of the Diocese of Brooklyn. There's a lot more news headed your way. It's Christmas time in the city. Just wait until you see how beautiful the Diocese of Brooklyn's Christmas tree is when it's lit. Plus this. this is the He's a Grammy-nominated Christian singer, and he's bringing some Christmas cheer to Brooklyn. There's still time to get tickets for the Big Spirit of Christmas concert at the brand-new Emmaus Center. We'll tell you how you can get yours. Plus, a hometown hero who is receiving a big honor. We speak to his family about how faith guided him throughout his life. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. Just like that, it's Christmas again in Brooklyn's Grand Army Plaza. This year is Bishop Brennan's first Christmas in the Diocese of Brooklyn. He had the honor of lighting the diocese tree this year. Amid the hustle and bustle of the city, Bishop Brennan said it's a moment to take in the true meaning of the season. Merry Christmas. It reaches 27 feet into the sky, but after looking at the star on top, the kids we spoke with were more curious about the bottom of this majestic Christmas tree. Can you imagine how many toys would fit under that Christmas tree over there? How many you think? A million. A million toys? What? What a million hundred? Well, give or take, the tree is now sparkling with 16,000 lights representing the diversity of the Diocese of Brooklyn, also known as the Diocese of Immigrants. I think it's pretty amazing. Bishop Robert Brennan thinks so too. It's his first time celebrating Christmas as the Shepherd of Brooklyn. I'm so glad and so proud of the sales media for being such a big part of this. So I'm happy that we're the ones offering this to the community. And many in the community came out Wednesday night to witness the lighting of the tree and blessing of the nativity scene. It definitely touches my heart. It definitely touches my heart. It fills me with spirit. Monsignor Sean Ogle, chairman of DeSales Media, which sponsors the tree and creche, delivered the opening prayer. May this tree, when it is lighted in this holy season, remind us always to live ourselves as worthy living branches. Members of the NYPD also in attendance for this joyous occasion. The NYPD and the church, we enjoy a, a excellent, excellent relationship and we value the relationship with the church and uh, it's strong. Bishop Brennan says he hopes everyone who passes by this sacred scene will be filled with hope during the Christmas season. As the people pass by, they see Emmanuel. God is with us and that can make a world of difference in every facet of our lives. I had the pleasure of emceeing the event and Bishop Brennan told me the tree and crash are a visible sign of what we try to do every day here at DeSales Media show the joy of the gospel. Rejoice, 
You know the saying, singing is praying twice. Well, nine-time Grammy-nominated artist Matt Marr will be doing both in the Diocese of Brooklyn. He's just one of the performers headlining Monday's Futures in Education Spirit of Christmas concert. Proceeds from the annual event help inner-city students receive the best education money can buy, a Catholic education. Ahead of the concert, I spoke with Monsignor Jamie Gigantiello, the Vicar for Development, and asked him how he got the Christian music legend to come to Brooklyn. Well, I have to be honest, I, I can't lie to you. I mean, I'm a priest, but uh, really, uh, Craig Tubiolo, uh, executive director of the Emmaus Center, he, he has a lot of contacts in the Christian world and okay. media and all. So he was the one that got him. I said to him, you know, we got to get someone well known. Uh, so he, he reached out to him and he graciously accepted. And we're very excited because we wanted a big name for the, you know, this is the grand opening of the Emmaus Center and it's the first big event there and we want it to be, be good. Of course, we're gonna have Daniel Rodriguez mm -hmm. to America's Tanner, who's always been a friend of ours and you know, he'll perform a couple of Christmas songs in the beginning, get the people going. Uh, and then uh, Matt will come on. So we're, we're very excited about the night. Absolutely. And now you're saying it's the first big event for the yes. Emmaus Center. Yes. Tell us about the Emmaus Center. Remind us about okay. it. You know, why is this so important well, for the Well, it's the first opera house in, in, in Brooklyn and on all of Long Island. And about a year and a half ago, they came to me and they asked me to promote it. So I'm the chairman of the board oh, nice. and I'm, you know, there to really get this thing off the ground so we can evangelize not only to our people, the new evangelization, but also to many Many people in the neighborhood that really uh, are disconnected with the church okay. and God. We have a lot of hipsters, young people in the neighborhood, Williamsburg, right. and that's what we called it. I, I, we were thinking of a name, so I came up with the Emmaus Center because on the road to Emmaus, after his resurrection, they didn't recognize him. Mm. But it was only when they were walking and he started opening up the word and recalling the accounts of what had happened in Jerusalem that they recognized him. So it. this, get the people in through the arts mm -hmm. and then hopefully plant the seed of faith, Jesus, in their hearts. That's the purpose of it. And it's a great event to yes. have there. Tell us, how will this concert benefit the children? Where exactly does the well, money go? Well, this is for futures in education. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, it all goes to scholarships and many of our donors will be, be there that night. And it gets us into the Christmas spirit as well. And you know, uh, we're looking forward to this night. We wanna highlight the center. And we'll, we have many thing plans, concerts, mm -hmm. exhibits throughout the whole year for the Emmaus Center. And we really wanna get this off the ground. We need to get out there. Yeah, and now, so I know it, it benefits futures in education. Talk a little bit about the importance of futures in education. If we didn't have it, what if, what if there was no futures in education? What would that mean for well, a lot of kids? Well, I hate to say it, I would say uh, majority of our schools would close. Wow. Because, and that's a strong statement. Right. Because we give out almost $7 million a year in scholarships. Wow. And the children pay half, we pay half. Mm -hmm. If it weren't for this, many of the kids would not be able to attend our Catholic schools, that would bring down enrollment, right. and then the, the cost will go up, more children would not be able to afford it, mm -hmm. so you know, it's the domino effect. Sure. So Futures in Education, over the last 27 years, 28 years, has given out over $110 million wow. in scholarships. Wow. And if it weren't for Futures in Education and the generosity of our donors, uh, I said to say that many schools would close, let alone the, the effect it would have in so many of these children's lives mm -hmm. you know, and their families. So how much is you normally raised at this Christmas concert? Well, I mean, it varies. Uh, every year, you go from a couple of hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, when we first had it at Carnegie Hall, the first year we raised almost a million dollars. Wow. Uh, but, you know, things have changed and, you know, mm -hmm. we have many more, you know, projects going on that people donate to. And, and, you know, so that's why we constantly have to get new donors. Yeah. And, you know, the Christmas concert is a, a great time for everyone to get involved. It's the spirit of giving. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone wants to be an angel. You know, Christmas is about angels. They yeah. come, they bring us good news. Well, hopefully people would come to the concert and we can give bring good news to many more students. I love it. And who doesn't love Christmas music, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> Monsignor yes. Jamie Gigantiello, Vicar for Development here in the Diocese. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Missy. Bye-bye. And it's not too late to get into the spirit of Christmas. Just go to futuresineducation.org and click RSVP here on the homepage to get your seats. Again, that concert is this Monday, December 13th at the Emmaus Center in Williamsburg, and all the money goes towards a Catholic education. Still to come on Currents News, a big honor for New York Cardinal Timothy Dolan, why he was given the Spirit of Francis Award. And an honor that's been a long time coming, the late Gil Hodges finally in the Baseball Hall of Fame. We spoke with his son.
any induction into the Hall of Fame is just a, a wonderful tribute, not only to your playing abilities, but to your character. The whole interview next. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24 hour number 718 517 3122. We'll be right back. beat out an infield hit. Hodges slams an outside pitch over the fence in right center field. Scoring Perillo ahead of him. And Brooklyn takes a 4-3 to three lead. First baseman, manager, all-star, and devout Catholic. That's how the late great ball player Gil Hodges is being described. But now you can add Hall of Famer to that list. The former Brooklyn Dodgers and New York Mets star is posthumously being inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, a national honor and recognition for his family. Kurt News' Jessica Esop spoke with his son, Gil Hodges Jr., about the long-awaited tribute in an exclusive interview. Well, it, it's been a long time coming, but we're certainly thrilled that it finally came to fruition. We all think uh, that it's uh, well-deserved, and we're glad that it happened. Describe that moment when Jane Forbes Clark, the Baseball Hall of Fame chairman, called your family with that amazing news. Um, well, I live in Florida, and my mom is in Brooklyn. So like we do whenever this situation arises, um, my sister, who lives in Brooklyn, was at the house with her. And when she got the call, she handed it to mom, and mom got to hear um, Jane Forbes Clark tell her that dad was elected to the Hall of Fame, and she just couldn't believe it. It was just, you know, a long time coming. What do you think your dad would say about all of this? I think he'd be thrilled. Um, of course, any induction into the Hall of Fame is, is just a, a wonderful tribute, not only to your playing abilities, but to your character. And I think that's something that he would be very proud of. Now, your dad was not just a great ball player. He was a devout Catholic. Tell us about how he practiced his faith on the road and how he helped shape the Catholic you are today. Well, he was. He was a very devout Catholic. Um, he felt very strong about his religion and his religious beliefs. I, being the only son, got to travel with dad during the summer. And whenever we would be in other cities, every Sunday, Regardless of the city, regardless of how late we got in Saturday night from the ball game, Sunday morning we were up and we were at church, something he believed strongly in and taught all of his children the same thing. Do you and your family have plans to travel up to Cooperstown in July? We wouldn't miss it. This has been a long time waiting, so yes. Gil Hodges, Jr., son of Baseball Hall of Famer Gil Hodges, congratulations and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me on. All the best. And thank you, Jessica. Congratulations to the Hodges family on this momentous recognition. And Gil isn't the only one with a huge recognition this week. New York Cardinal Timothy Dolan was awarded with the 7th Annual Spirit of Francis Award. Catholic Extension, a Chicago-based papal mission society, honored Cardinal Dolan for his solidarity with the Catholic Church in Cuba and for his advocacy for the weak and marginalized. Since 2016, Catholic Extension has made a commitment to help rebuild 100 churches in Cuba and proceeds from the award dinner benefit the initiative. And that is Cards News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.